So I do not have a video today. We're kind of going old school. I couldn't find one that I liked. But I will say that I've stolen um, some stuff. So I want to give credit to uh, Devin Huss. He's a pastor, a Christian church pastor. And, uh, and then uh, I'm going to be citing the book, Am I Ready to Be Baptized by Kyle Butt and John Farber. Okay, so I just want to give those out. Um, I was reading some articles lately that says that if we use anything, we're supposed to give credit. And that's only fair. Uh, and I did read through several sermons this week, as I always do, just to kind of see if there's anything. And I really like this. So I'm going to start with this. And this is out of the book. It says, imagine that you have been hiking all morning. You are getting tired and you're ready for a break. As the sun climbs higher in the sky, you come to an opening in the trail. In front of you is a trail with forks in two different directions, the right and the left. As you look down the trail on the right, you see that it starts to go uphill not far in the distance. And it looks very hard to travel. There are logs and rocks in the path and even some thorns that are hanging over the trail. Grass has overgrown the entire trail, not just because not many people have traveled it. As you look on the left side, it's much wider, so wide you could drive a steamroller as it. As you look at it, you see that it goes downhill, not far in the distance. Walking down is always much easier than walking up. Also, there are soda machines and so uh, snack shops on the side of the trail, all for free. As you stand there, you try to decide which trail will I take. You see other hikers coming up your way. In fact, you start to see many, many, many hikers. Most of them take the path to the left. They stop at the snack shops and the soda machines. But they never, ever seem to eat or drink enough. They just keep going from shop to shop to shop, always wanting more. Once in a while, you may watch a hiker step up and, and, to the sign and actually read the sign. And the hiker will read the sign and then takes the path to the right. I wonder what the sign says. So you walk up and you begin to read, and the sign, a large wooden sign divided in two large sections. The section on the left talks about how people on the left and the part of the sign on the right talks about the path on the right. It's easy. Most people take it. Have you noticed the tremendous emphasis today on the broadness? There are people who would like to take the loud and broad way. Ultimately, everybody is walking in that way. The sign talks about the snack shops and the soda machines on the left, which you saw. But the sign also tells you something interesting about those places. It tells you that the snacks will taste good at first, but then they will hurt your stomach. It talks about the, 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 the pop and the soda, that at first it will taste sweet, but eventually it will become sour. And both of them will become very, very addictive. You also learn that the soda feels good in your mouth. But eventually it will burn you. It will burn your throat and it will burn your chest. And it also is more and more addictive. The sign on the right, or the, this sign also says that it leads to a huge lake of fire. The hill in front of the huge lake slopes down sleeply, steeply. Everyone who does not get off this path before they come to the bottom will eventually slide and slide and slide until they are in the lake of fire. Now you read the sign on the top about the right. The climb is steep uphill, but the city at the top is beautiful. And inside that city is a king and his son, and they feed all the hikers who make it there. The streets of the city are paved with gold, and the gates are wide open. No one will ever cry in this city. You also discover that no one ever has to leave this wonderful city. The weather is never too cold. It's never too hot. Everyone is always nice to you. No one will be mean or bully or, or yell at you. And no, no one in the city will ever make another piece, person feel ugly or not smart. The best part of the city is that no one ever dies. The city sounds wonderful. My question to you today is as Jesus continues on, what road are you on? The poem by Robert Frost, he starts, Two roads diverge in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both, but be one traveler long as I stood and looked down as far as I could to where is bent in the undergrowth. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew 7. 
We're going to be in Matthew 7. We're very close to finishing up the Sermon on the Mount. My, my challenge to you for the next few weeks is go back and read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Read them all again and absorb what Jesus says. What's interesting is I, I got to thinking about this. Um, occasionally we have gone to different places, Turkey Run or, or Starve Rock and stuff with the kids. And there's a, a lot of times that we'd like to hike. What I have found interesting is in that short story, how many people will just look? Have you ever done that? You're out hiking, and you go, ah, which way should I go? And there's a big sign there, and, and you don't read the sign. You go, because that way looks a whole lot easier, especially if you've been hiking for a little while, right? It's interesting because I, I know Denise and I, we're, we're geeks. We read the signs. My family, on the other hand, finds it boring when we read the signs. They're like, come on, let's just go. And I'm like, well, which way do you want to go? I don't know. Let's just go that way. Why? I don't know. And I thought about that. And I get it. There's, a, there's times that especially we've been hiking for a while, I'm like, Yeah, this way looks good. But is that our Christian walk? Is that truly what we do as Christians many times? When we've been in the battle, things are going to garbage, we're struggling, we're tired, we're cranky, and we stop like this and we go, God, is it worth it? Man, that one's a whole lot of, man, look at that soda machine. <laughs> Could get a couple Mountain Dews right now, a couple Butterfingers, a couple bags of chips. I'd be, I'd be pretty happy. And yet, that Butterfinger always leads to what? The next Butterfinger. Trust me. The other day, those minis, I had nine. And the only reason I know that is because I looked in the garbage can. I'm like, wow, who has been eating all of these? And then I realized I needed to refill my little candy container. So it was me. Because one was never enough. It just didn't satisfy. Well, they're only one bite. They're just little. And then another. And then, of course, with that, I had to have a pretzel because you have to have the salty and, and the sweet. And I noticed my big pretzel container was about halfway down. And I thought, Denise is going to call any minute for lunch. And I'm not hungry. I am stuffed, but I feel horrible. I feel really sick to my stomach right now. I'm like, I've crossed over. I'm an old man. I can't do this anymore. And, and, and then I came across this, this story, and I thought, how many times in our Christian walk do we fill up, fill up, fill up on the world, and then when it's time to show who we are, we can't because we're Addicted, we're full, we're just can't. Matthew 7, verse 13, Jesus says this. Enter the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who will enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few that will find it. Right now, Satan is running rampant in our world. He's out of control. He's not only in our schools and our jobs and our workplaces, in the gas station and the grocery store, he's in churches. And he is doing his best to pull every single person he can. Yet we all rely on Jesus won the war, but the battle for our soul right now is still going on. We have the decision every day to live for the narrow road or for the wide road. Now, there will be times in our life that we fall and we start to go on that wide road. And I, I can remember talking to many, many people, especially in my last profession, uh, as they were in the ambulance. And, you know, I wasn't supposed to talk about this whole God thing because, you know, separation of church and state. But every now and again, I would see a shirt or something and I'd say, hey, how you doing? And they'd be like, 
you know, I'm just right before I die, I'm going to pray. And I'm like, you know how many people I have seen dead in a car that I wonder if they said the same thing, but it was too late when the semi hit them? Don't live your life on the wide road hoping that that last quick moment, dear Jesus, I love you, and that's going to be all good. Because that's not what Jesus calls us to be. He calls us to live our life, not last seconds, our life for him. He says the wide road is wonderful. Think about it. The wide road, the path, it's everything you could want in this world, but it offers death after life. Jesus says, my path is tough, it's thorny, it's narrow, but I will walk with you. I will lead you through it, and when you get to the end, I and my Father will be standing there and welcome you in. His path leads to life. The wide road seems so fun though, doesn't it? But I could go to parties and I could watch anything I want to and I could speak any way I want to and I could look at anything I want to and I could be anything I want to because that's what the world says. Jesus says just live for me. Live for me. We've gone through almost the entire Sermon on the Mount. I want you to think back to the Beatitudes. Blessed are those. And think of what did they receive. Then he went on to tell us that our worldly riches are not everything, but the heavenly riches where what moth and rust can't corrupt is where we should be placing our treasure. He now goes on to tell us, and it's a way, he's just reiterating everything that he's already said. He's going back and saying, but you need to live this way. We have an example, a couple of examples in the Bible, in 1 Timothy, where Paul is talking about Demas, and he's a Demas, that is, there's a couple in the Bible, but one that walked away from the faith because he loved the world. Every day you have a choice. Every day. Every second of every day you have a choice. Why? Because I guarantee that every day something is going to come in your life that you have to make a decision. And you either pick the wide road or you pick the narrow road. You either pick what is right or you pick what is kind of right. Maybe if I twist it hard enough. But it's more self-gratifying and more self-pleasure than it is right. I want you to think about that. As we go on, let's keep going here. First Peter. I hope I didn't mess my slides up. Can you go back one? There you go. First Peter, your homework is going to be um, to read all of uh, Second Peter, I'm sorry, Second Peter. I hope I can find it. Why? Because I was going to read the entire chapter as we stood here, and I thought, well, that might be, become a little tiresome. So, uh, come on, James. I really need to get those little bitty tab things, but then that would be cheating. All right, Second Peter, chapter 2. And we're going to start at verse 1. Again, I encourage you, read all 22 verses later today. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. Now, I want you to think about that for just a minute. Peter is writing to a church congregation. Peter's not necessarily in the workplace going, hey, there's going to be some bad people that are coming around. Be careful. Who did he just say? He said, among you. Now, I want you to think about pastors today. Yeah, I'm one of them. And I have never, ever in my three years of being here told you to believe a word I said. Did I? I told you to look it up on your own. Read the Bible on your own. Because I'm telling you, I can make you believe anything I want to if you're going to be a lost sheep. 
I love the book of Revelation, and I love, there's a video that we've been doing right now through uh, Ozark Bible College, uh, one of the professors through, for our Sunday school, and he has said it probably 20 times already. The Bible will say anything you want it to say if you take it out of context. I can make you believe that the Bible says anything I want it to if I take it out of context. Trust me. False prophets are doing that right now in our churches. We have churches that are being led by not fully vested or inspired men of God or men of someone. We have churches that are going by the wayside. We have churches that are believing and accepting and doing anything they want to do because they're being led astray because the church inside is not strong enough to read on their own. Do not believe a word I say. Read it for yourself because that's how you grow. Listening to me babble for 30 minutes a week ain't going to make you grow in the narrow path. It may help spark an interest, which is all I hope to do but you open the book on your own and make it your own and make the relationship with Jesus Christ your own. Not mine, because I can't take you to heaven with me. I can only lead. I can't grab you and take you with me. Peter goes on to say, those among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master Jesus who, brought, who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon them. Many will follow in their sensuality because of the way that, of the truth that will be um, misaligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago was not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Read the rest of the, the 19 verses, and he's going to go on and tell you more and more and more. We are the church. Now let's define the church that is a body of believers that sit in a building that we think is beautiful and that's all we have to do, right? We just have to come sit in here for an hour a week and we are golden good. I'm glad nobody raised their hand because I had a book I was going to chuck at you. No, we are a body of believers that want a personal relationship with Jesus. It's not just about the corporate fellowship. It's about my relationship with Jesus Christ. And if I'm not opening up the book, I will be led astray. Have you ever listened to another uh, teacher or preacher? And you go, I don't, I don't know about that. That doesn't sound, but then you didn't do anything about it. You didn't go back and read on your own and go, you know what, I, I kind of disagree with you on this. I have made enemies going, I don't agree with you. I've been kicked out of churches before, or a church, because I sat down with the guy and said, I don't believe anything you're saying. Prove it. Well, 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 no, no, no. Prove it. Because this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, and here's biblically why. Get out. <laughs> no problem, you won't see me here again. Are we strong enough to do that? And I'm not saying that we just become confrontational. There is an amount of grace and amount of love there, but we need to be ready for that battle because I'm telling you what, when the battle comes to us and we fail, will that push us farther down the wide road? When we start to question, questioning things in the Bible like, man, I don't get that. Is good if you do something about it. But if you go, God, ah, uh, uh, and you keep walking, you keep walking farther and farther and sliding down the path, drinking more of the soda that burns your throat and more of the chips and the butterfingers that never satisfy. What path are you truly on? Jesus keeps going here in Matthew 7. Let me get back to it. I'm sorry. Usually I use those little thingies, and I forgot to do it this morning, and I thought, well, I'm going to prove to them that I actually do read the Bible, and I know where stuff's at, but I forgot how long it takes. Matthew 7, verse 15. Jesus is going to keep going here. Beware of the false prophets. Those who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears fruit, but a bad, free, 
bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. What does that mean? What does that mean? What is someone's fruit? Well, let me ask you this. If you've got friends that don't know you're a Christian, you're a tree that's not budding. Now, I'm not saying you walk up to everyone and grab them by the shoulders, I love Jesus, but it ain't a bad thing. Honestly, if, if, if most of your friends think you're not a Christian, then you're acting more like the world than Christian. Because I guarantee, uh, I, would, well, I would say 75 to 90% of the guys that I know that are not Christian, if I'm acting exactly like them, I'm not acting Christian too. Guarantee it. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't associate with them. That doesn't mean that I don't love them. That doesn't mean that I don't try to be an influence to them. But whose influence is greater? The wide road or the narrow road? When you walk out of these doors today, are you going to just start sliding again? Or are you going to start climbing? Where is your priorities at? Jesus says, be very careful of the false prophets. Why? Because they're everywhere. I want you to think of what's going on in our world today. Make no mistake about it. The church is under attack. The church is very clearly under attack. And it could get very clearly much worse soon. Who are you solid with? I'm not talking about politician. I'm talking about are you solid with Jesus on the narrow road or are you solid with Satan on the wide road? Because I believe that soon will come a time that we may have to make that choice. Yeah, I know the end times, you know, everybody, oh, when are, the end times started in 33 AD when Jesus Christ himself ascended into heaven. That was the end times began. When he's coming back, don't know. I don't really care because the way I look at it is I'm ready. Are you ready if today you walk out massive heart attack in the, in the driveway? Are you ready that on your way home you get hit by a, a Mack semi with an airplane crashing and then an astronaut falling on top? I don't know what can happen. We don't know what can happen. But are you ready? Are you on the narrow road? Because we don't know. You know, for 30 years, I, I believed as a fireman, every day I went to the firehouse, I may not come home. This may be my day. That call may come in, I can fall through a roof, I can fall through a basement, I can be on a car accident on I-55 and 294 and get whacked by. Today, I may not go home. And you know what I realized? Is that every one of us are like that. I still, I still believe that to this day. It says that if my name is written in the Lamb's book of life, it is on this day. It doesn't matter what I do. Whether it's COVID or a car accident or falling out of a perfectly good plane and my parachute didn't open. That is the day that will be. Are you ready? Because the funny thing is, I don't know when that day is. Is it today? Is it tomorrow? Is it 30 years from now? I don't know that, remember a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago I did that thing. It said I'm supposed to live to 76 or something. So I think I'm good because the internet said that I'm going to live to 76. So I got some years on me. But what, is, what does the book of life say? Are you ready? Are you living every day as though you are ready to meet your maker? Are you prepared for that day? We need to be very careful. Are we producing good fruit? So the next thing I, I, I asked a question earlier is, if you are known by your friends, do they know who you are in Christ? If, they, if, if the answer is no, then what kind of fruit are you bearing? Will you win every single person that you come in contact with to Christ? No. Jesus didn't. The apostles didn't. But did they say, I'm not going to try? No. They still lived godly lives 
and they still portrayed who Jesus was to everyone else. Even, as we know, every apostle except for who? John died, was, was murdered, was martyred. So are we ready? Are we ready right now for this fight, this battle that's ahead? For too long, I believe the church has been very comfortable sitting down going, we're the church, man, we're good. They'll just keep coming to us. And now we live in a world that Satan's taking a foothold. And they're not just coming to us because we're the church and we're the golden ones. We're the church that needs to be ready for battle. We need to be ready for battle. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the, or those with habitually drunk, nor verbal abusers, swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed and you were cleaned, for you were sanctified, but you were also justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the Spirit of our God. I'm not saying that, er, that there aren't those that are going to come to Jesus. I'm asking you as the body of believers, if you're rock solid on the narrow path and ready to start pulling them up, from the wide road. And that's a question I think we need to ask ourselves. You know, it's funny. I can remember talking to a lot of guys that, that said they were Christian. It's like, okay, if you die right now, where are you going? And they would say, what? Oh, I, I don't know. Well, that's a wishy-washy Christian in my opinion. Because if you aren't saying, I'm, I'm ready, take me today. I'm not, not saying that I don't want to go because there's some more beating on kids I got. I'm kidding. Um, but if I go today, I'm ready. I know that I have been forgiven and that I am covered by the grace of Jesus Christ. But when a Christian goes, ah, I don't know, then there's things that need to change. Are you on the wide road or are you on the narrow road? And if you're on the middle road, remember that there's a fork there. So you're standing where Jesus says, no. If you're right in the middle, I don't know you. Remember in Revelation, the lukewarm church, the narrow path church, he says what? I will spit you out of my mouth. Are you wide road or narrow road? Are you becoming a false prophet to those around you? Because the other side of that is if you say, I am a Christian, people know you are a Christian, but you're living for the world, guess what you're doing? You're teaching bad behavior. You're teaching anti-biblical things because people will see you and go, well, he's a Christian. He does it. It must be all good. She's a Christian. It, it, she does it. It's, it must be okay. We've got churches now that are saying, well, it's all about love, so you can do that. You, you, you can do that. It's okay. And we've lost our courage for the word of God and for the truth. You stop reading on the path and watch the path. Only a few people ever take the right. When people say, you're very narrow-minded, I will often say, you have no idea how narrow-minded I really am. And when you think that I am, and whatever you think I am, I am a lot narrower than you think. I am only narrow because it is the truth. I didn't invent this. Men didn't invent this. This is the word and the living God. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you enter. You do not. You will not enter. There is no other way in. Any deviation from the person of Christ Jesus, the work of Christ Jesus, or the gospel of Christ Jesus will lead you to hell. You must enter. You must make a commitment to come to Christ, and this is the only way. God has the right to do it this way. He wants it this way. He wants all to choose this way. But it is amazing to me that even today, how popular it is to assume there are all kinds of ways to heaven. So then the question is, is well, what about happiness? Why don't I have happiness? Where is my happiness? Not in unbelief. Voltaire was an infidel in the most pronounced way, and he wrote, I wish I had never been born. Not in pleasure, 
Lord Byron lived a life of pleasure. He had anything he want. He wrote, the worm and the canker and the grief are mine alone. Well, it's not money. Jay Gold, the American millionaire, had plenty of that. And when he was dying, he said, I suppose I am the most miserable man on the earth. Not in poison or fame, Lord Baconsfield enjoyed more than his share of both. And he wrote, youth is mistake. Youth is a mistake. Manhood a struggle. Old age a regret. Not in global military. Alexander the Great conquered the entire world in his day. And having done so, he wept and said, there are so many more worlds to conquer. Guys, you can go after the world all day long. It will never satisfy you. It will never leave you full, and it will never leave you with the knowing and the peace in your heart that when that day comes and you are not here anymore, that you will be with him, the king in heaven. To recap, there are, there are, according to Jesus, only two ways, hard and easy. There is no middle ground. To enter the two gates, the gates which are broad and narrow, there is no other gate. Trodden by two crowds, large and small, there is no neutral group. Ending in two directions or destinations and destruction in life, there is no third alternative. It is hardly necessary to commit to such, to such talk as extremely unfashionable but necessary that we talk in this way. People like to be uncommitted. Every opinion poll that you'll ever take shows not just a yes or a no, but also a convenient, I don't know, for men are lovers of Aristotle and of the golden rule. The most popular path is the via media or the middle ground. Today, Today, I encourage you to make a choice. Walk on the wide road if you want. That's your choice. But it leads to destruction. Walk on the narrow road that will lead you to the presence of God the Father. And the amazing thing is, is He is with you the entire time. Robert Frost finished his poem like this. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in the woods, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Dearest Father, we are just in awe of your grace, of our foolishness, your mercy in our mistakes. Father, today, Today, help us to commit to a life with you. Help us not to be wishy-washy and, and wonder. Help us to not be led astray by the false prophets and the false teachers that are in our world today. Help us to stand firm with the Holy Spirit inside of us to speak your truth and not to be false prophets ourselves. Help us not to be bad fruit, Father, but help us to be the fruit that continues to to grow, that others would come to know your name and your grace and your mercy and your love. Father, we praise you for the opportunity to be changed, to be made new, and to be given hope for life eternal. Today, Father, today is the day I pray that we make a commitment to you. As we leave this building today, Father, put challenges in our way that we may glorify you and raise you up. Give us strength and give us courage in these weird times and times ahead. And we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.